Well, in case you haven't been paying any attention, uh, Async08 is now stable in Rust. Um, this is a huge milestone for the language and I think systems development in general. So very exciting. Um, again, my name is Tyler uh, or Team Andre. Uh, I work on uh, Fuchsia, which is an experimental operating system at Google. Uh, we use Rust for a number of things in the operating system. Um, I work on the toolchain team supporting Rust, which means that uh, sometimes I get to spend time uh, fiddling around in the compiler. Uh, and I'm also a Rust release team member and compiler team contributor. Um, so I just want to briefly uh, give kind of a, a primer on futures uh, before I dive into some of the async stuff. Uh, Florian covered some of this. so. Um, just to recap, uh, a future is any computation that progresses asynchronously. So that could be um, that could be like a request to some external database server. Um, could be like reading and writing to disk, or doing some expensive uh, data processing on another thread, something like that. Uh, all of these things can be represented with a future. Um, eventually produces a result, which is called its output. And we represent futures in Rust with a future trait. Uh, so you can see there's an associated type called output, which is the output of your computation. And then there's this uh, method called poll, which has kind of this scary signature. But uh, the job of the poll method is to um, make progress on the future, as much progress as possible. Poll returns an enum called poll. Um, and basically the poll, the result of the poll method is always either pending, which means that I've made as much progress as I can and now I'm waiting for some external event, or ready, which just means that I, I'm completely done and here's the result of my computation. And the important thing to remember is that in Rust we have a lazy futures model. So futures don't do anything until they're polled. And it's the job of the executor to do that. OK, so I want to talk about uh, async functions in this talk. And um, I'm going to start with a really simple example of an async function. So uh, here's an async function named handle request. Uh, we're going to take some arguments. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to issue a request to an external database server uh, to get a row from our database uh, corresponding to the ID we were handed. We're going to await the result of that. So basically suspend execution of this function until we get the row back. Once we get it back, we're going to encode it into JSON. And then finally, we're going to um, write the encoded JSON out onto a TCP stream. Now, if you're coding this synchronously, um, you're your function would block your thread um, at two potential points. Um, one is when you're basically awaiting the database server, and the other is when you're writing out to a TCP stream, because uh, TCP sockets on many platforms have a buffer that can fill up. And if the buffer fills up, you'll block your entire thread. And at minimum, you'll pay a context switch, um, or your thread could be locked for a really long time. So the way this can connects to future, um, as Florian mentioned earlier, is uh, we rewrite the signature in the compiler of your async function to just be a normal function that returns impl future. Um, and that means that we are returning some type. We're not going to tell you what type it is that happens to implement the future trait. In this case, our async function did not have a return type, so the output is just the empty tuple type. And then inside of the function body, we just wrap it with an async block. So let's talk about what the compiler uh, actually does uh, when you compile this async function. Um, and to do that, I want to walk through how you would implement this by hand in the like, pre-async await world. Uh, so the way you would do that is you want to create a, uh, a data structure that represents like the state of your request. Um, and so we're going to do that. We're going to call it request handler. And uh, to start, we'll just stick all the arguments to our function into that. Uh, struct. And then we're going to implement future on that uh, request handler. 
Again, uh, our async function doesn't return anything, so the output associated type is just empty tuple. And then we're going to implement the pull method. Um, so the way you implement this by hand is by writing a state machine, which is what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to add a state field to our struct. Uh, it just keeps track of what state our request is in. And then inside the pull method, every time we get pulled, we're going to match on that state um, and basically behave accordingly. So the very first state that we can be in is uh, we've never been pulled before. This corresponds to the very top of the async function. The next one is that we're getting the row. Um, so we're waiting the result of the database. The third is that we're writing to our TCP stream. Uh, notice I didn't create a state for encoding the JSON. Um, that's because that's a synchronous operation. There's no await. And then finally, we're completely done and ready to turn our result. So uh, let's go back and actually fill in the. So in the state, in the case where we've never been pulled before, we're going to just uh, basically execute the very first line in our function. Um, so we're going to call get row, and it's going to return a future, which we're going to store in a field of our struct. Then we'll update our state to getting row. Um, so like I said, uh, get row returns a future. Um, we're going to store that in a field called rowfute. And we use an option here because uh, when we initialize our data structure, we have to initialize all the fields. So we need to be able to say, I don't have the row yet. There are none. Uh, and then when we do have it, uh, we'll initialize it to sum the value of the future. Um, then once we're called, uh, we're, we're pulled when we're in the getting row state, uh, we're awaiting some sub -future, right? So we need to propagate this call to pull down to the future that we're awaiting, right? So we'll do that. Um, we know there's a, a future inside of rowfute because we're in the getting row state. We call pull on it. If that uh, call to pull returns pending, uh, that means that we can't make any more progress in our function because we're awaiting some other future and it can't make any more progress. So we just simply propagate that back up the stack. Uh, if we get pull ready, that means, uh, okay, the row's ready and so we can make progress. Um, so the very first thing we do is we can uh, deallocate the row future. We don't need that anymore. And then we're going to uh, do the next thing in the function, which is to encode our row into JSON. And then we do the next thing, which is to uh, you know, create the write all future. So we call write all. Um, again, we're going to store the value of that future in our, our state machine. And then we're going to update our state to be writing. All right, so the next state is writing. This one's really simple, basically the same thing that we saw before. Um, we're now awaiting the, the right fute, so we're going to propagate our call to pull down to the right fute. Again, if it's pending, we'll return pull pending. If it's ready, um, there's no output of the right, or so we just immediately update our state to be ready. And that's it. The ready state is really simple. You just simply So there's one last thing that we need to do, um, which is add a loop around the, the inside of our body. And that means that every time pull gets called, we make as much progress as we possibly can until uh, we either hit a pull pending on like subfuture or we're completely done. Um, so basically, we will constantly loop until we hit one of these three return statements in the body. So you notice there's quite a bit more code on the right side than the left. Um, it's not as readable. And so that's one major benefit of async await, of course. Um, and in fact, we actually cheated um, and actually made the code a little bit more readable than it would have to be in real life. Um, because we're actually um, we're borrowing one of our struct members uh, with self.encoded inside of the value of the right. Here. So when we call write all, we're handing it a reference to um, basically coded buffer. Um, and you can't actually write this in normal Rust. You'd have to introduce a layer of indirection with like a smart pointer or something. And it ends up being like really uh, not, not fun. Um, and this is an issue that comes up a lot in the async. Um, 
But thankfully, uh, with async await, all of that is taken care of for you, and it's more efficient. Uh, the compiler just says, OK, I know that you are borrowing yourself. And thanks to some abstractions uh, like pinning, we can guarantee that this is safe. Another problem with our hand implementation uh, that you might notice is we're actually wasting some space here. Um, anytime we're uh, like in the middle of getting the row, we don't need, have any need for the right butte, um, encoded bytes. And then in the next stage, when we're writing to the TCP stream, uh, we don't need the real row feud anymore. So it would be really nice if we could uh, not allocate all of that space and just kind of reuse the bytes. Uh, if we look at the way that it's laid out in memory right, right now, um, we got like byte offset zero of our structs, and you have all of the, the fields. Um, so this is the way it is now. Uh, what we'd really like to be able to do is basically Again, reuse those same bytes from row feet, uh in the next stage when we're awaiting uh, the right feature. So um, as recently as a few months ago, uh, the compiler didn't do this. And um, this problem actually compounds really quickly. So um, if we assume for simplicity's sake that um, you know, the, the size of our future is basically dominated by the size of all the sub-futures, um, then we're roughly twice as big as we need, not reuse, reusing those bytes. Um, and that's a problem, uh, but it actually gets worse because, um, well, row feet and write feet, those are written as async functions, and those each have their own problems where they're awaiting different sub-futures, and so really those are twice as big as they need to be. So really the future we're writing isn't twice as big as it needs to be. It's really four times as big as it needs to be. And then if that gets awaited by some other future, then maybe that's like eight times as big as it needs to be. Um, this really did happen in practice. So in Fuchsia, we would have futures that um, you know, took up like half a megabyte on the stack, which is just really big. Um, and well, we had a lot of futures that actually blew the stack. And uh, you, know, you can actually seg fault in Rust if you uh, go past the end of your stack. Um, it's not undefined behavior, but you can set fault. So uh, what the compiler wants to do is it wants to ask the question, okay, well, which of these fields can I overlap? Um, and the way it does that is it looks at the control flow graph of your program. I'm going to zoom in here so you can actually read some things. Um, so this is kind of a graphical representation of what's called mirror or the mid-level IR inside of the Rust compiler. Um, we represent the entire program as this control flow graph, um, where inside of every block, these are called basic blocks. So like on the left side in the middle, you'll see basic block number 14. And inside of that block, there's a bunch of statements. These are very, very simple statements where you can only do things like, oh, I would need to allocate storage on the stack for like a local variable, or I need to access one member of this variable or dereference something or assign something. There's no control flow inside of the basic blocks. All the control flow happens between the basic blocks uh, along these edges here. So um, at the end of basic block 14, we drop something. And drop is an operation which can panic. So there are two options. Either we return and go down the happy path, but normally what you think about, down to basic block 23. Or we panic and we unwind, uh, going to basic block 7 to do all of the cleanup in the case of panic. So what we're going to do is so we're going to draw this entire control flow graph and figure out which variables are storage live at the same time. Uh, storage live is how we represent that we actually need storage for a variable. Uh, we're not actually going to do that because we don't have three hours for this talk. Uh, so we're just going to squint at the source and, and see if we can figure anything out. You can do this at home. That works pretty well. So um, the first question we're going to ask is, OK, can I overlap row few with encoded? And the uh, the rule of thumb here is, uh, you know, if, if the last time you ever use a future is, or sorry, the last time you ever use field A happens before the first time you ever use field B, then you can definitely overlap this. So in this case, uh, you'll notice the last time we use row feud is we set it equal to none, and then the following line is the first time we ever use encoded. And you can kind of reason about this by looking at the source and say, okay, definitely. 
these are never needed at the same time. So yes, we can overlap these in memory. When I say overlap, I mean just reuse the bytes, right? Uh, okay, so what about row few with write few? Uh, again, in this case, uh, row few, the last time we ever use it is setting it equal to none, and then later on we, we use write view. And so we can definitely overlap these two. And then the last two fields that we care about are write few and encoded. So in this case, um, we assign to encoded, and then we uh, assign to write few, and we're actually handing out a reference to the encoded bytes, um, which means that we definitely need these at the same time. Write view actually contains a reference to encoded, um, so we can't overlap these in memory. And so what this allows to do is exactly what we said we wanted to do. Uh, we can actually just overlap these bytes. So what this ends up looking like is not so much a struct, uh, but more like an enum, uh, where you have one variant for every state your future could be in. And inside of each enum variant, uh, you have all the fields that you need for that particular state. Um, so in general, um, in this table, we have like all of the enum variants. So we could be in unpolled state, suspend 0, 1, 2, et cetera. And then all of like our local fields on the left here. The only difference between a regular Rust enum and this is that you can have one field and multiple variants. Um, so like in this example, we need local A starting in the suspend zero variant, but then also need it in the suspend one variant. Uh, and so you can have uh, one local that per persists across multiple await points, right? That comes up quite a lot. So uh, I want to talk about, this is all very cool, but you know, what are the performance implications? Um, <clears throat> so uh, let's look at some patterns that you, you might not realize have like subtle performance issues. So uh, in this example, uh, we have a function called do stuff. Um, we take a context, which is just uh, you know a smart pointer to some context somewhere, and um, what we're going to do is we're going to log. Uh, some debug info with the context. And then we're going to call some other async function foo and await it. There's a subtle performance issue with this code. Um, can anyone spot it? Not if you think you see it. Not seeing any nodding. OK. So, um, so what can happen is you know, at the end of every scope is when we drop our local variables, right? Um, and so the compiler is going to insert a, an implicit drop at the very end of our function. Um, but we don't actually need context until the end of the function. We just log it at the very beginning. Right. And so um, we're actually hanging on to this smart pointer to context um, all the way through awaiting that original, uh, that future, and then you know, finishing the task, uh, which is kind of inefficient. You know, if we have the only reference to context, then uh, we'll be uh, keeping that memory around. We don't need to be. So uh, what we're going to do is, um, you know, one, one way to, to mitigate this is to uh, move that context into um, basically an inner scope in the function. And the effect of this is that we're actually moving the drop until the end of that inner scope before the await. And this is quite a bit better. Um, we're not hanging on to context while we're awaiting some other future. That future could take a year to complete. We have no idea. Um, but it's still not perfect. And the reason for that is, uh, remember, uh, futures do nothing until they're pulled. And in the case of an async function, that includes all of the lines at the top of the function. Um, so none of these lines will run until the first time pull is called, which means that we're, safe, we're still hanging on to context while we're in that unresumed state. So the quote unquote perfect way of dealing with this is um, to actually desugar our async function um, into a regular function called do stuff, which returns simple future, like we saw earlier. Compiler does this for you, but you can do it yourself. And at the very top of that function, we'll do our log, and then uh, we'll uh, write an async block, which drops us into an async context where we can await anything we want and uh, actually evaluates to a future to return. And because we don't reference context inside of the async block at all, we never have to save it inside of our state machine. So 
uh, we aren't allocating any bytes to uh, save the smart pointer and also never in, you know, uh, hanging on to that reference uh, inside of the future. Uh, so once do stuff is called, we just immediately log and then we, then we return a future that can make progress later. Um, so another uh, pattern to look out for is when you're awaiting expressions that have really big, complicated libraries. So in this example, I have a struct big, which has an array in it that's just a kilobyte in length. It's a pretty big type. Um, we're going to implement drop for big and just do something really silly, like print a message when uh, the destructor is called. Uh, then I have an async function foo from u size to u size. Doesn't really matter what it does. And then inside of my async function bar, um, we're going to uh, con uh, we're going to construct a big simply to get the length of the array out, uh, and then call foo with that length. So this is semantically equivalent, right, to calling foo with 1024. Um, let's say we don't want to repeat ourselves, and we forgot that const was a thing in Rust. Um, so we're just actually going to construct it on the stack and get the length out. And normally, you know, the compiler could just optimize this away and it would, it would be fine. But what happens when we try to print the size of the state machine that bar returns? We're going to get something really big back. Uh, our state machine's over a kilobyte in size. That's because it actually is embedding a copy of big inside of the state machine. The reason for this is that uh, yeah, Rust has well-defined semantics for when destructors are run. And anytime you create a temporary inside of a statement, um, the destructor for that temporary is called at the very end of the statement. Basically, if you have a temporary expression inside of a larger statement, fast forward to the next semicolon you see, and that's when the destructor will be run uh, for that temporary. Uh, which, in this case, is not good, because uh, that happens after our await. So uh, this is something to look out for, and um, it's pretty easy to mitigate. Um, so in this case, we could simply get the link uh, inside of one statement. There's a semicolon in between that statement and the next await, and that would be fine. We can also write it like this, um, actually constructing the entire foo future um, inside of one statement and then awaiting on the next line. It doesn't really matter. Um, in either case, when we print the size of our state machine, it's going to be much, much smaller. We're not embedding a copy of big. Now you might say, OK, that seems like a problem. But if the temporary you know, de doesn't have a constructor, in other words, it doesn't implement drop, um, we should be able to optimize that away. Like We don't need to hang on to this copy of big in between, because we never need to call the destructor on it. Um, and you'd be right, um, except unfortunately we don't do that optimization today. Um, so that's kind of a future thing uh, that we would want to do in the future. So uh, you know, for now, just always look out for big, complicated temporaries. Uh, this only comes up occasionally in practice, but it's something to be aware of. So should you use async await? Yes, uh, definitely use it. It's now stable. Um, but it's a quote unquote minimum viable product. Um, that means that we're taking advantage of sort of the Rust release process where we release a new compiler every six weeks to iterate on the language and the compiler implementation. That being said, um, all of your code should, uh, all of the state machines that get produced should be as good or better than hand rolled in most cases, um, with a few notable exceptions, and that's going to continue to improve. Um, I got to talk to some of the people writing the C++ coroutines proposal for 2020, uh, which is a really interesting talk. Um, and that's sort of their version, C++'s version of async await. Uh, and so there are a couple differences uh, between theirs and ours. Um, one major difference between Rust and the current proposal uh, for C++ is that any time we allocate anything on the heap in Rust, um, that allocation is always made explicit. So if you await another future, um, it always gets rolled up. Uh, all of the state for that future gets rolled up into your state machine, your data structure. And we don't allocate it on the heap unless you like create a box and put the future in there. 
Um, in the C++ proposal, uh, there's actually an implicit heap allocation every time you await a future. And in many cases, the compiler can optimize that away, but there are no guarantees. Um, you can't, yeah, there, there's a possibility to kind of trip over a new, uh, an optimization uh, and have the optimization fail, and now you have a new uh, heap allocation in your program uh, in the C++ program. Um, Rust has fewer language level extension points. So um, one consequence of releasing a new standard only once every three years is that you kind of try and shove everything in at once. Um, this works for C++, but uh, in the case of Rust, we kind of have a minimal uh, uh, you know, service area. Uh, the benefit of that is that you have to do less work uh, to keep your code performant. C++ gives you a lot of hooks and things that you can customize, but in Rust, you just don't really need as much that stuff. Um, another difference is that we're building on top of a newer language, so we have less legacy. Uh, uh, async await is not just for web servers. Uh, there are a lot of things you could use it for, and I think there are really a lot of implement interesting applications out there. Uh, one is uh, high-performance compute. Um, another is actually file systems. So anytime you're writing to or reading from disk, that's a whole lot slower than your CPU. So I think there's some interesting applications there. Uh, device drivers might be an interesting thing. You know, I'm working on operating systems. So that's what I'm thinking about. Um, build systems. Uh, you know, anytime you are writing a build system, you're basically, uh, you know, you're, you're starting like a compile step, and then that can take a very long time. So there might be some interesting applications there uh, for expressing build systems and build rules. Um, and UI is another way. Um, so you can imagine showing a pop-up user and then like awaiting the response, things like that. Uh, it's really just kind of a paradigm and a way of writing code that allows you to express what you want in a really high level way. That's my um, if any of this interested you in terms of the compiler or uh, just getting involved in the Rust project in general, I highly encourage you uh, to, to contribute. Um, there are lots of ways you can attribute, contribute. Probably the simplest way is if you hit an issue, whether it's a compiler bug or a confusing error message, um, it's a great idea to file an issue for that. And there are people who do nothing except look for confusing error messages in the compiler and fix them, and they're awesome. Um, so definitely report things. Um, if you feel like picking up an issue to tackle, there's a lot of like easy or mentor uh, tags in the Rust repo, so you can look for that. And take advantage of the community. Um, I mean, one of the things I love about Rust is that it has a really strong community and people that are always uh, happy to support you. Uh, so there's a few different places that you can go to kind of post, ask questions. Uh, there's me. Uh, you can find me on, on Twitter, GitHub, Gmail. Um, and there are also working groups that you can join if you kind of want to have more of an ongoing uh, uh, contribution. Uh, here's a short list of some working groups in the compiler team, but there's a lot of other working groups uh, and other teams, uh, you can find a list online. Um, and that's everything. So we have time for questions. You mentioned that Fuchsia's use of the generators prior to those optimizations being implemented was about like uh, uh, like what half megabyte on the stack or more. After the optimizations, can you share how much it shrank by? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I don't remember that particular one. I think we shrunk it by you know it's it like by over eighty percent. Um, some of them, so some of the features that we had shrunk by like, well, didn't shrink at all, but some of them shrunk by like 80 to 90 percent in size. Um, and so it just depended on how like deep the stack of uh, features that were being awaited was. Um, the desugaring um, of, of the loop uh, showed that it's always like there's a loop and a match so that even if you go from one um, basic block to the next, it would like jump to the top of the loop and rematch again. Is yeah. that how it 
actually compiles or does it optimize it so that if you don't away if you don't suspend the execution it just falls through to the next basic block without jumping up to the top and then matching it there jumping so, back down right uh, yeah so it does actually uh, have a loop um, in there so anytime you have a await um, that is actually where the loop is introduced right. so anytime you await some like sub future um, we basically pull that future in a loop um, so what I'm doing is sort of semantically equivalent, but I'm putting the loop inside of the inside of the poll function, uh, or it's around the body of our entire poll function, which is essentially doing the same thing. Um, I'm just not embedding a loop at every single await point because then it wouldn't fit on the slide. So um, async await has been stabilizing for four years, right, or something like that. Uh, it's now it's stable. So are you seeing something that uh, might show us that that was a mistake? We should have waited a little bit more? No pun intended. Ooh. Um, Uh-oh. So, so did, we, did we make any mistakes? <laughs> I, think, I think time will tell. Um, I think I'm, I'm really happy that we took the time to bake, um, even though a lot of people are uh, understandably we're upset by this. Um, yeah, I don't think that there's any uh, like red flags or things, mistakes that we made. Um, so some of the performance things that I covered, um, like the fact that we hang on to a temporary until the end of a statement, even if there's a wait and a wait, um, that was a change that was introduced like a couple months before stabilization. Um, and so I think that makes sense for the consistency of the language. That's how the language works outside of an async context. Um, but yeah, you know, it's possible we could have defined the language differently and just silently changed the semantics so that you know you don't hang on to temporaries across an await. Um, time will tell if that was right. Hi, uh, uh, thank you for the talk. It's really interesting. Uh, thank you. I'm curious about the state machine. Uh, can you ask the compiler to emit uh, either the, I guess not Rust source, but like the mirror for what the state machine generates? Uh, yes, yes um, you can. Uh, it's a nightly only flag, so you have to download the nightly compiler, and it's not super uh, user friendly. Um, what am I doing? I already I'm going to show you. But uh, yeah, so this uh, diagram that I showed in the slides is actually generated by that. Uh, it's, uh, it actually emits like a, a doc graph file, and you can render it. Um, but so there's a couple different modes, but there's like Z emit mirror, and then like Z, I can't remember the flag, but uh, you know, uh, message me and I'll, and I'll send you the flag. Uh, there's a really nice uh, documentation called the Rusty Guide, and it's for people working on the compiler. You can go find it there, even if you just want to see your state machine. Well, thank you. Give a big hand to Tyler. <laughs>